Hi. So, as promised, we will talk about this quantity called the circulation, which is defined as U is a velocity field as before, and there's a dot product in between. It's important to, so this, this seems like a line integral, a closed line integral since we've written it like this, yeah? Now, the line L, the line is a closed contour moving with the fluid. This is important to keep in mind. As if the contour is frozen into the fluid. Okay? And so, it is in this particular situation that, that this uh, definition of circulation is uh, valid. And, um, and the next thing I want to say is that uh, this entire discussion is, is valid for incompressible, meaning the divergence of u is 0, right? Inviscid, meaning the viscosity is negligible. Barotropic, we will Maybe I've, I've said this earlier, but, but uh, essentially uh, saying that uh, the pressure P is a function of rho. Fluids uh, under the influence of conservative body forces. Okay. Body forces are conservative. In other words, if there is a body force G, it can be expressed as the gradient of a scalar potential phi. With this, just want to emphasize once again here, with this potential phi refers to the potential which describes the body force. It's a gravitational potential. It's not the velocity potential. Okay? We use the same symbol for both, so I, I, I figured I would emphasize this. So, at any rate, all of, I, all of our you know, discussion which we are going to have right now takes all these uh, uh, restrictions into account and the definition of circulation that we will be talking about is this, where this DL is a closed contour that is moving with the fluid, in some sense frozen into the fluid. Right? So, with those caveats, let us move ahead. And so, this is the definition of the circulation that we, we, we just said, uh, the circulation K is, is this. And uh, so, what we do now is the Euler equation uh, that we have uh, seen earlier, instead of writing it in the lab frame, we write it in the Lagrangian frame. It is a little more convenient because you see this, this, this contour that we are talking about is moving with the fluid. So, naturally it makes sense to be sitting on top of a fluid parcel so that this contour is not changing for you. Okay. You are sitting on the top of, of top of the fluid parcel and you are watching stuff go by. So, you write down F equals MA in that frame so that you know uh, defining the contour is also easier. You are sitting on top of the fluid parcel and the contour is not changing as far as you are concerned. Okay. It is still a closed contour. So, the Euler equation using the material derivative is, is this and uh, from the definition of K, uh, this definition you do this operation u dot dl uh, all through the equation. And uh, this connection, as you might already have guessed, uh, this connection is made uh, using Stokes theorem. You relate the line integral to the surface integral using the curl. right? I, I sometimes uh, write the area element as ds, sometimes I write it as da. I am hoping that the context will make it clear uh, what I am talking about. In this case, anyway, we, we were not yet talking about the, uh, the surface integral. We just do a, you know, a line integral of all terms here. Right? Before that, the du dt, I, I write down as uh, you know, the line integral of du dt is, um, you know, um, I, I dot it like so. There is this component and then there is this component. In other words, the circulation can change because the velocity itself is changing or the line element is being stretched or compressed. It is moving with the fluid, but you are allowing for the fact that the shape might change and that, that is this term here. 
Okay? So, that is dk dt from, uh, on, on the left hand side and on the right hand side you have remember you have the, uh, the, the uh, gravitational potential and you have the uh, gradient of p and so you do the line integral again uh, be, be because that is what we were doing to, to all the terms of the equation and you have d phi, uh, gradient of phi dot dl and this is just a perfect differential and we, we got this is a perfect differential because you see there is already a gradient of p yeah? and because we want to uh, retain just this term on the left hand side this one this fellow it goes over to the right hand side right so that is where you get this yeah so as such there is nothing there is no, there's no mystery it is just a simple rearrangement of terms and uh, the important thing here is that each term is a perfect differential. Okay? You see there is a gradient of phi and it is dotted with dl. So that becomes a perfect differential. This is already a perfect differential by uh, definition and I claim that this is also a perfect differential, this term. Why is that? d over dt of dl is a u, right? so it is a half u squared. So, therefore, the, int the integration integral of any perfect differential along a closed path is 0. Okay, that is the whole point of a perfect differential. It is uh, you, you integrate it uh, along uh, around a closed path and uh, the integration is 0 and which means that dk dt is equal to 0. In other words, the okay, by the way, before saying that you remember just, just wanted to uh, emphasize that this whole thing was uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you could you could write it. It started from the vorticity equation, and you could write this down. You could write down the vorticity equation in this form only because the gradient of rho and gr gradient of p are parallel, which is true only for uh, barotropic fluids. I want to emphasize this once again. Okay, so what we've now said is that the the time rate of change of vorticity is zero. In other words. The circulation, this this quantity k, k is conserved, right? So circulation is conserved in an inviscid barotropic fluid. Also, importantly, uh, where it, it, it's true only for situations where either the body force is absent or the body forces can be described using a conservative potential. Okay, that that's not written here, but I want to keep. I want you to keep that in mind firmly. So, if the circulation was zero to begin with, it will always remain that way, right? So now, here's a here's a bit of a conundrum. Um, you must have, I mean, water, right? I mean, th there's no. Before I launch on this description, uh, on on this example, I, I just want to say that there's no such thing as a perfectly inviscid fluid. These are all approximations. But nonetheless, uh, water. Um, you you think of water as a pretty much inviscid fluid. The viscosity is not very high, especially in comparison to a fluid like uh, say honey, right? Now, we are saying that the circulation is conserved, vorticity is conserved, right? Uh, in other words, if there are no vortices to begin with, you know, uh, vorticity cannot be generated. But you must have noticed, you take a hose and uh, of water a hole and, 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 and the flow coming out of that hose uh, is, is fairly laminar. It's not a very turbulent flow, so that you, 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 and the streamlines are nice and well behaved. There's no evidence of of, of uh, vortices, right? Now you take a, a, a hose of water uh, uh, so that the flow out, uh, the, the water flowing out of the pipe is fairly laminar, and you aim it at a wall, right? And what happens at the wall? All hell breaks loose, right? I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of vorticity, and lots of, lots of these vortices are generated. So what gives? Right? How come vorticity is being generated um, you know, at the wall and, and, and so uh, that seems to uh, violate this. Right? Uh, it seems to be generating vorticity from, from nothing. The answer to that lies in the fact that there are very large velocity gradients that are being generated right at the wall. Okay? In other words, the, 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 the fluid is coming to an abrupt halt at the, at, at the wall and so uh, you know uh, the diverge, uh, the, the gradients of u and so on and so forth are, are, are being uh, th there are very very large gradients 
of velocity that are being generated right at the wall. And as we will see, once we start talking about the Navier-Stokes equation, we will see that there is no such thing as, an, well, I said that in the beginning, there is no such thing as an inviscid fluid. While viscosity might well not be important in the bulk flow, it becomes important in places where the gradients or the velocity are large. This is because the kinds of terms that we will see uh, when we discuss the Navier-Stokes equation in a, in, a, in a little bit, the viscosity appears in this combination, like that. Okay? So, the del square is, is a second derivative. Okay? So, mu might well be very small, the coefficient of viscosity might well be very small. Okay? But when the gradient of velocity is large, as it would be when the water is coming to an abrupt halt, to say nothing of the second gradient or the second derivative, this one, the second derivative is even larger. So, as a, as a result of the fact that the second derivative is large, the, the, combina the, the, the multiplication of these two, this assumes importance. So, this term, which is essentially the only combination in which the viscosity appears in the, in the momentum equation, this term assumes importance even though mu is small in the bulk of the fluid, this term assumes importance at boundary layers such as the one where, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the water jet is, is meeting uh, the wall, okay. In that thin boundary where uh, velocity is going to zero uh, over a very small thickness, so du dx, so to speak, is large and d square u dx square, which is what this is, becomes even larger. So, the, 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 the multiplication of these two terms assumes importance. And so, uh, viscosity, the, the, one of the basic things uh, that is implicit in the in Kelvin's vorticity theorem, which is that of an inviscid fluid, uh, this gets broken down even for water. That is why uh, vortices can be generated. Okay? So, this is a, again a, a very simple explanation to an apparent conundrum. And, uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is the general uh, you know, uh, statement. If vorticity is a 0, it will always remain that way. If on the other hand, there is some vorticity, it remains that way also. Okay? Now, we come to this as was the case with the Bernoulli constant. Uh, we used it to uh, demonstrate a, a couple of interesting real life examples. Here is, is, is a real life example that I would like to illustrate that uses uh, the concept of circulation, if not the concept of uh, uh, Kelvin's vorticity theorem, it at least. Uh, so, you recall the potential flow around a cylinder, you recall this. This is what the flow looked like, right? Yeah, and uh, around a ball, say. Yeah, and uh, so, like so, with the and by the time you reach it, you are very far away, it is as good as straight. Now, there is no circulation here. If for some, if on top of this, I impose, just, be, just because I say so, okay, let me impose a circulation. In other words, let me impose a streamline that looks like this. So, bear with me, I will tell you why. Okay, let me impose a circulation on top of this. I add this kind of a circulation to the flow by hand. Okay? In other words, I add a k. This is a non-zero k. The fact that I have added this kind of circulation to the flow. Yeah? In this case, the streamlines now start looking like this. In other words, the streamlines because this circulation adds here and subtracts here. You see here, down here, it is, you know, this, this streamline is opposite to the direction of this streamline, whereas he, up here, uh, the streamline is in the same direction of this streamline, right? So, it adds up here and subtracts down here. So, as a consequence, the streamlines now start looking like this, where they are more densely packed at the top and sparsely at the bottom, okay? Now, what is this saying? What is the density of streamlines? What does it say? In other words, the velocity is higher here right so it's um, and right 
So, as a result of the fact that there's lower velocity here as opposed to here, the pressure below will be larger than the pressure above. Yeah? In other words, there is a net, a net upward force. in this kind of a situation, right? Where, what kind of a situation are we talking about? One where I have arbitrarily added a circulation of this kind to a potential flow, okay? And I'll tell you why this is useful in a minute, but the, the bottom line is that in this kind of a situation, this body will experience a net upward force. So, now I've mentioned the word spinning ball. This obviously has to do with the fact that I've included a circulation here, right? Now, although we are talking about an in inviscid flow, right? Let's for a moment uh, think about a real life situation where the viscosity is not negligible. So let's think about a situation where the ball is spinning in this direction, right? I impart a spin to the ball. Okay, this ball is spinning in this direction. Now, viscosity is all about sticking, sticking a fluid, right? So the fluid sticks here, and because the ball is spinning, it tends to drag the fluid along with it, yeah? So the fact that this viscosity generates circulation. So it's the same thing, in effect, it's the same thing as adding circulation by hand, okay? So, if the ball is spinning, it generates this kind of circulation. If you generate that kind of circulation, well then you have this kind of situation where the velocity up, uh, the, the, the velocity of air above is smaller than the velocity, sorry, the velocity of air above is larger than the velocity below and therefore the pressure below is larger than the pressure above and therefore the ball experiences a lift, okay? The direction of force is perpendicular the direction of the lift is perpendicular to the rotation axis. The rotation axis, as, as you know, is, 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 is inward like this uh, into, the, into the plane and as well as the local flow. Okay? This is very similar to Lorentz forces, uh, which, which are, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of, very similar to that, okay, in, in electrodynamics. So this kind of thing is used by, by tennis players when they impart a top spin in the ball. You know, I mean, uh, when uh, a tennis player wants to make sure that the, that the ball does not go outside of the court, right? Uh, he or she imparts a top spin, okay? So when they impart a top spin like so, what happens is, because of this Magnus effect, there's a downward force on the ball. So the ball kind of curves and it falls within the baseline and it do does not go out. And that's because there's a downward force and, and, and there's a curve. And this, it's the same thing with a, with a, with a uh, cricket uh, spinner. And th this is not as common. Uh, mostly it's used by leg spinners, wrist, wrist spinners. And what happens is when, when, the, when, when the wrist spinner gives a uh, vicious uh, spin to the ball, uh, there's often a dip. Okay, and that deceives the batsman. And this, this is what uh, the Magnus force is all about. This is not swing. Okay, this is not uh, and this is not the swing effect that fast bowlers use, and, and that's much more complicated. Okay, swing is when there's a sideways movement. Here, this this is a case where there's a downward or upward. In this case, the direction of the force is upward, but uh, you know, and in tennis, you know, you you either give a top spin or you give a slice. Okay, when you give a slice, you're doing this, and then there's an upward force, and and when you give a top spin, there's a downward force. You, you can work out the direction of the forces and it's essentially this, the Magnus effect. Uh, so uh, before we go on, I figured, uh, so we will be going on to discuss viscosity from now on. And uh, so all of this uh, stuff that we talked about right now had to do with inviscid fluids, inviscid, uh, incompressible uh, fluids um, also uh, subject to body forces that could be described by uh, a conservative potential. Uh, also, when we, we when we're talking about uh, you know circulation and, 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 and uh, conservation of circulation, we were also talking about barotropic fluids. Uh, so, so this kind of wrap, wraps up uh, 
you know, this section of the course. And from now on, we will start talking about viscosity. We will pay some attention to viscosity and we will introduce the Navier-Stokes equation. And as you will see, we have already seen the Navier-Stokes equation uh, earlier. Uh, we specialized from there on to the Euler equation where viscosity was zero, but we had actually seen the Navier-Stokes equation in, in a slightly different guise uh, because we, had, we were already, already talking about shear forces, a shear, yeah, so shear stresses, and shear stresses intrinsically have to do with viscosity. Um, so uh, we will just introduce the Navier-Stokes equation in a, in a minute, and so for the time being, uh, we, we will close this discussion here. Thank you.